I was at a, uh, Monday morning. a uh, graduation party yesterday in a very crowded room. And what I've learned is my voice doesn't carry very far. I think when God says, Tony, I want you to be a preacher, and he laughed. Uh, he says, you guys in the back, read lips. Let's, let's pray, ask God's blessing in our time this morning. Father, thank you for the gathering of uh, uh, friends and brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you for our opportunity to look into your word. Father, please, may the things that we see be directly from you. Grant us understanding and application. And do it, please, Lord, to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Uh, let me put a PS to that prayer. Uh, pray for uh, my wife, if you would. She's not feeling real well this morning. Not bad. She's just... Uh, the after, we're, we're finding that the aftermath of a stroke is uh, tiredness and weariness. And mm -hmm. So this morning she has the tired and the weary. But I'm okay. I made my own coffee. So wow. don't, don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, a combination of a praise and a Lord be merciful with the overturning of road versus way. Uh, in my lifetime, by far the most significant thing the Supreme Court has ever done. Uh, and I don't, I, basically they made it a, uh, a political thing in a good sense of putting it back to the states. Um, and that was the intent of our founders. I, I'm not in favor of federalism. Uh, so uh, let's pray that God be merciful, that uh, this won't cause even a greater divide in the country. Uh, and may we uh, that are glad uh, not be boastful and arrogant. Uh, I am sure that there are people who believe that uh, a woman's right to choose is stronger than our belief in the sanctity of life. Uh, so let's be merciful. Amen? Amen. But firm. All right. Uh, we're, we're still in the upper room discourse. I, I've uh, let, may I encourage you, read chapters 13 through 17 a couple of times or a few times or slowly at least. Um, it is now probably, in my estimation, the most powerful portion of scripture there is. I, I, and I've read, you know, read the Gospel of John countless times. Uh, Fifty years ago, next Sunday, uh, I'll, I'll be celebrating my 50th year as a Christian. July the 2nd, 1972, came to Christ at Billy Grand Crusade. And the first thing we studied David, was the Gospel of John. And here I am, 50 years later, still learning from the Gospel of John. Powerful stuff. Uh, this has nothing to do uh, with our context of the lesson. But in my study, I'm finding other things that I, I didn't realize. And, uh, I've had a semester of Greek 40 years ago, and I can read it, don't have a clue what I'm reading, but I, I know the alphabet. In the New Testament, there are 7,967 verses or sentences. Of those, 5,212 of them begin with the Greek word chi, which is and. I never realized that that was basically the punctuation from thought to thought to thought to thought. We use periods. There weren't any periods in the Koine Greek and when it was written. There were not even that separations of the words. So when a new thought, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And, and nobody does that more than John. John's gospel uses the word kai more than any other. 
which shows that John's gospel uh, was most likely originally written in Greek, not Hebrew or Aramaic. Uh, with that, three dollars you can get a coffee at Starbucks. Uh, at least a snack. Tough crowd. Now, let's go. Let's just grant me a couple of uh, moments. The upper room. I've been to what is the traditional upper room. I don't believe it's that. I, it may be where it was, but it's not the upper room. But here's what we can know of the upper room. In uh, Mark Scott's, Mark 14, 15, there's a quote, a large upper room furnished and ready. Uh, I believe it was almost, or maybe even really, a banquet hall. <laughs> you know, Jesus and his disciples in their ministry was successful enough to have an administrator. Judas, he was, he was, the, he carried the purse, uh, and even when, when he told Judas, "Do what thou doest, do as quickly," the disciples thought, while well, he had the money. He was going to do what? Go buy food for the banquet. And then, after the resurrection, where were the disciples? In an upper room. They were gathered together. Jesus walked in. So they stayed there. They, they hid there. It was a, a kind of a secretive place that the authorities didn't know that Jesus was there, or I'm sure they would have went there to get him, let alone in the garden. And then on the day of Pentecost, where were they? In the upper room. And we know that there were 120 adults. Um, I believe there were some children as well. So my guess is at least 150 people. So it's a big room. Um, so that's where this all took place. And. Uh, when we read the Bible, we need to read it in several forms. It's true history, accurate history, uh, especially the writings of Luke. Even historians consider Luke the greatest of the historians. And then he wrote the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, the, the history of the first church, the early church. But here, I'm trying to understand in my reading and rereading these five chapters, the type of teaching Jesus did was a didactic teaching is like instruction. Do this, 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 and this. He did that somewhat, but it was more, um, I want to use the word informal. It, it wasn't point one, point two, point three. And, and here, here's five things that I think when we read these, and especially when we go in today's uh, text, the first thing that Jesus focused on was personal relationships. Uh, no longer do I call you servant, I've called you friends. They'll know your believers by your love for one another. Uh, may the love that the Father has for me and me for the Father be in you and you towards me. I mean, it's just uh, unbelievable. And then, you see, the relationships, the relationship of God and the Father and the Son, the relationship of the, the vine and the branches, uh, the relationship uh, for the end. Now, you have this, you're my friends, now go. Go, go do this with them, uh, to love one another. And then in, in our text, in the beginning of uh, John 16, uh, I believe Jesus drops a series of linguistic bombshells, or word, word bombs. I mean, everything he says 
is the most intimate, the most personal, the most heartfelt that you read anywhere else in the, in the scripture. He said, and he starts off in uh, John 16, verse 1. All this I have told you that you will not fall away. Now think with me, think with me. Then the next thing, you're all going to fall away. Oh, and Peter, you're going to deny me three times tonight. Judas, you're going to betray me. Uh, John, you're going to run away naked. Uh, if you read the text, he did that. Uh, and then he goes and he says, it's good that I'm going away. For if I don't go away, the comforter won't come. And when he comes, he'll convict the world uh, of sin, of righteousness, uh, of judgment. And so this introduction to where we are today, I have much more to say to you, he says, uh, more than you can now bear. Uh, uh, Bob and I were speaking earlier. Uh, 50 years ago, next week, I'm reading the Gospel of John for the first time in my life. And, in a Billy Graham Bible study. Oh yeah, I got it. That's easy. <laughs> Fifty years later, I don't, I don't know, Lori. Yeah. <laughs> I, I knew a whole lot more 50 years ago than I knew today. Yeah. <laughs> I would hope that that is understanding more than knowledge. Knowledge puffs up. Love edifies. That's what we have in this text. Let me, please let me encourage you again. Read those five chapters, John 13 through 17. At one sitting, read them through. Read that discourse that took place in the upper room. Uh, and if you have the time, you might want to read it in a couple different translations. Uh, just to not miss any of the verbiage. Uh, again, 25% of the Gospel of John is given to a few hours in that upper room. There we go. Okay. Now we're all caught up. Let's, uh, let's get into today's text, and it's going to be from John 16, verses 16 to 24. Jesus went on to say, In a little while you will see me no more, and then, after a little while, you will see me. At this, some of his disciples said to one another, what does he mean by saying, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me, and because I am going to the Father? They kept asking, what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he's saying. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this, so he said to them, Are you asking one another what I meant when I said, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? Very truly, I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you. Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly, I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask, and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. All right, that brings us to our first point today, which is, we, like the disciples, may be asking the wrong people. In verse 16 and 17 says, His disciples said to one another, What does he mean? The Bible re repeatedly warns us about being careful about the company that we keep. You know, wrong influences can point Christians in the wrong direction and, and it might hurt our testimony and our closeness with the Lord. What we learn or what we're told by the wrong pressures can direct us in making many decisions that we might regret. And, and throughout the Bible, we see this happening. Uh, we see Adam listening to what his wife told him to do rather than obeying God's command. 
We see Aaron, who succumbed to the pressure from the people around him and made an idol. We see the people of Israel listening to the ten spies who didn't have faith in God as Joshua and Caleb did. And we, we saw that Saul lost his position as king whenever he chose to do what the people wanted rather than to obey the Lord's commands. You know, too many times we, we fall into this problem of, of taking advice from newspaper columns, TV personalities, social services, psychologists, and many other sources. People read their horoscopes, silly things like that. They, they heed the advice without ever considering what the Lord would have them do. And, and most often, that advice turns out to do more harm than good. Thus says the Lord about any matter should be the first concern when we're discerning what to do about it. God has successfully raised trillions of children. Seek advice from His Word, the Bible. Seek direction by prayer. God's advice is never wrong. Why didn't the disciples simply ask Jesus what He meant? The Bible doesn't necessarily tell us why, but it's probably because they were afraid of looking foolish. They didn't ask questions. They, sh they should have asked Jesus instead of each other. He, he, he had right there the king of the universe to ask those questions. We see that again in Scripture in, in 1 Kings um, chapter 12, verse 8, where it says, Rehoboam rejected the advice the elders gave him and consulted the young men who had grown up with him and were serving him. Now, Rehoboam was Solomon's son, and many assumed that he would continue on this Davidic dynasty and be the next king. Um, ironically, it's the only son of Solomon that we actually know by name. When Solomon had a thousand wives and concubines, but we read about only one son that bears his name, and he was a fool. The city, Shechem, where they came to, had a lot of history. Abraham worshipped there. Jacob built an altar and purchased land there. Joseph was buried there. It was the geographic center of the northern tribes. And it showed that Rehoboam was in a position of weakness because he came where the, where the ten tribes were on their, on their territories instead of demanding they come to Jerusalem to meet with him. Now Solomon was, was a great king, full of wisdom. And the people that served under him had, had sought after his death, they sought a, some relief from the heavy taxation that he had forced upon them. And they offered Rehoboam alliance to him if he would agree to that. So first, Rehoboam sought the advice of the older advisors. These were the older experienced men, and, and they had served Solomon well, giving him great advice. And they knew that Rehoboam was no Solomon, and they couldn't expect the same thing from the people that Solomon did. He had to relate to people on who he was, not who his father was. If he showed the kindness in the servant's heart to his people, they'd love and serve him forever. That was good advice. But before he even consulted the younger men, he rejected the, this advice. You know, it happens a lot today. You go around and, and, and do something called advice shopping. You, find, you search around until you find somebody that agrees with what you think. And, and once you find that, then you're, then you're happy and you think that's good advice. It's better to have a few trusted counselors around that you can listen to, even when they tell you what you don't want to hear. And that's hard sometimes. So he consults, Rehoboam consults these young men that had grown up with him. And they're going to tell him the things that he wants to hear. And, and they give him this unwise advice. We, we find that um, Solomon had, had asked Israel a lot in taxes and services, and, and people didn't follow him out of fear, but they had a sense of shared vision and purpose with Solomon. They believed in what Solomon wanted to do, and they were willing to sacrifice to accomplish it. But Rehoboam didn't appeal to any of this sense of shared vision and purpose. He simply wanted the people to follow his orders out of the fear of being a tyrant. And so with a dozen rash words, this bumbling dictator opens the door for 400 years of strife, weakness, and eventually the destruction of the entire nation because he listened to the wrong people and got the wrong advice. Dang. That was good. A <laughs> <laughs> uh, thought, too many thoughts came to mind as you were sharing that. I think our natural tendency often is to seek agreement rather than good counsel. Think of a lot of the uh, 
kings of Israel. They would call the prophets and and they would, you will always prophesy against me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're gonna go, go. You're gonna prosper. Not. Uh, yeah, that's. And we we don't know. And I think. Not, they're sitting at the table with Jesus. You know, why didn't they go, Jesus? They know what you know. What's he talking about? Um, I think all of us are going to face things in our lives that we need guidance, we need direction. Um, yesterday, Sherry and I are on Google looking up after effects of strokes and stuff, and you know. Yeah. Trusting Dr. Google instead of our cardiologist. <laughs> you know, you know. And we're looking for answers. And I think the danger is looking for an answer to justify our thoughts. So, anyway, good, thank you. Um, then I, I jotted this down from my own personal note. The reason I pass out these outlines is so you can take notes, follow along. Uh, this is a go-to prayer of mine. It's been for several years. Saul, on the way from Jerusalem to Syria, Damascus, God knocks him off of his pony. He sees a bright light. He goes blind. And what does he say? Lord, what would you have me to do? Is that about the most perfect mm. prayer mm -hmm. when we're in any situation? Uh, I don't care what we're facing. Lord, what would you have me to do? And then with this caveat to that, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give this Holy Spirit to those who ask? Yeah. And, it's, and the answer is, Holy Spirit, guide me in what I am to do in this situation. Uh, we're not going to get, I don't believe we'll ever get to heaven. And, and you say, Lord, I ask you. And he said, well, you guessed wrong. <laughs> I don't believe his answer will ever be yes. It may be, what do you want to do? And he may grant us our, our desire. And go ahead and do that. And it may be because it's an okay or a right thing to do. Anyway, point number two. Thank you, Bob. Be careful that our asking are not indictments. They kept asking, what does he mean? We don't understand what he's saying. Uh, here, here's an example of an indictment. Mark chapter 12, verse 14. Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to what they are. But you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. The question, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? It wasn't a question. It was an indictment. Uh, but they didn't know who they were asking. I, they reach in the pocket. They, here's a denarius. Who's, whose picture is on there? Uh, that's Caesar. Uh, then give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. Um, in our questioning, oh, that's, especially as believers, let's be so very careful that we're not uh, interrogating or indicting. We're not the prosecutor, but we're the truth seekers. Um, in my years of ministry, I was fortunate enough, I believe, to distinguish the difference between a question and an indictment. 
And when I felt that it was an indictment, my first response would be this, why do you ask? And you can always tell an indictment from a question. Is, Pastor, I have a question for you. For a, I have a question for you. But they never put a question mark at the end of the sentence. And they get statement after statement after statement. After, just uh, here, teacher, we know that you're good. And you're from God. And you know all things. And you're so wonderful. And uh, how about paying taxes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think a, a great lesson here. Now, let me back up a little bit. I don't, we don't know, as Bob said, we don't know what the situation was. We, maybe Jesus was over there washing someone's feet or, you know, or uh, <coughs> ministering to Peter. And they're saying, what, what's he talking about? You know, uh, let's grant them the benefit of the doubt because they've been walking with Jesus for three years and had some understanding of his character and presence. Actually, let me, off, off subject, I carry this coin in my pocket and it has one word on it. Listen. Um, that's why I talk too much. And Tony, shut up and listen. Okay, Bob. <laughs> Is this an indictment? <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, myself. <laughs> Right. Point number three says one of the 307 uses of the questions of Jesus. Jesus saw what they wanted to ask him about this, so he said to them, Are you asking one another what I meant when I said, In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? That's verse 19. Um, this passage takes place right before... You know, Christ is arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, as, as Tony spoke about the, the upper room discourse. And it's only recorded here in the Gospel of John. And within the confines of this package, we this passage we see Jesus trying to explain to his disciples what was going to take place in these next few days. But as he begins to do so, his disciples become more confused and they start talking among themselves and and, and rather than asking Jesus as we spoke of. Jesus was standing right there. He knew what they wanted, but they, they wouldn't ask him. And, and don't we do the same thing today? We're all guilty of that, right? We want to have a better understanding about what God's doing in our lives. But instead of asking him, we just kind of murmur amongst ourselves. Here we see the proof of Christ's deity, that he was the omniscient God who knows all things, even the secrets in these disciples' hearts. He knew the, about their whispering. He knew about their inquiries. And he also knew about their secret desires that were concerning them. He said this before they put him to question. They were, they were bashful and backwards. Could have been afraid of shame. Um, he knows this and he's ready to open his mind to the meaning and explain himself to his disciples. And, and Jesus was a good listener. And the best form of dialogue is when you can ask legitimate questions. And there's some questions that he did ask. And, and you might think, why did he ask so many questions? Well, he was, he was wanting to engage. He wanted to build relationships. He, he was forcing those that he interacted with to think. He wanted to create conversations. He wanted his listeners to be more likely to own their conclusions. And he sometimes answered questions with questions of his own. And he even asked warm-up questions to, to get the conversation started. But there was similar, there was several different types of questions they would ask. Uh, one was a closed question or, or a polar question, which generally invited a one-word answer. Do you not say four months more, then comes the harvest? That's from John 4.35. He asked open-ended questions, which required a little bit more thought and encouraged people uh, to have a more wider discussion and, and really elaborate. What are you looking for? He says in John 1.28. He asked probing questions to really get some clarification, and usually in, in a, within a series of questions. Did not Moses give you the law? Why are you, at, why are you looking to kill me? In John 7.19. He asked leading questions, which would lead his respondent towards a certain 
desired positive or negative route. Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? John 14, 9. He asked loaded questions, which were seemingly straightforward and closed. How long, the example here is how long have you stopped cheating on your wife? <laughs> Where are you going to buy some bread for those who want to eat? John 6, 5. Wait, wait a minute. I didn't mean for you to read that. <laughs> That was, the, that was the gospel according to Folio. Uh, recall, recall questions that they required the recipients to remember a fact. Did I not chose you the 12th from John 6.70? Rhetorical questions that didn't really require an answer. They're usually indictments. For which of these are you going to stone me from John 10.32? And the tone and context and annotation and body language when his when the woman accused of adultery was there and he said, woman, where are your accusers? Has no one accused you from John 8, 10? These are all different types of questions that Jesus asked. And he was a great dialogue. He was a great listener, a great great person to to really um, show many different ways to, to bring his point across in, in powerful ways through the parables and through his questions. Fast. Can I give a testimony? You taught this before, probably a year and a half ago or so, about indictments. And I was sitting over there, and you were over on this side. I'll never forget it. I had just gotten a text from a family member whose, whose question was, who are you to blah, 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 blah. And I sat there, and after you taught that, I said, I, I don't have to give an answer. That's an indictment, not a question. So I was struggling with that. How do I answer her? And I just want to tell you, the Lord repeats things. And it, that's just another confirmation. And it's a year later, and there still wasn't a, a resolution to the problem because it's not. it wasn't asked as a resolution. It was asked as an indictment. And uh, I still live under that indictment from her, but I, I, thought, you know, I, you know, I don't have to do anything with it. It's I'd say, ask my attorney. <laughs> <laughs> He's that, an intercessor. That probably wouldn't go well. <laughs> but thank you. I just want to say thank you. That's um, the question mark wasn't invented until the 16th century. It was inferred that it was a question. So when the scriptures were written, and depending on, on the 51 questions that we have in John, uh, it's anywhere from 49 to 52, depending on what translation that we're reading. Uh, so it's the translator's decision where to put the punctuation, if you would, other than Kai. And we know that that's a sentence break uh, or a thought break. I sent Pastor Tony a, a text message this week. I was driving down, I left, just left the office, and and I'm driving by the, the church up on the hill there in Wintersville, and, and I see this big Tony Folio preaching this Sunday, his, his son, and, and I sent him a text message via Siri because I'm driving, and of course, there's no punctuation in it, so I, I said to him, just put the punctuation in wherever you want it to. I can imagine. Take a half hour. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's I, I, I am a, I'm a grammar Nazi because I have such poor grammar and it drives me crazy. Um, and part of grammar is punctuation. Uh, I, and I have, I have books on punctuation. One is, it is as good of a book as I've ever read on punctuation. It's called The Panda Eats, Shoots, and Leaves. <laughs> Depends where you put the punctuation. The panda eats, and then he shoots, and then he leaves. Or the panda eats, shoots, and leaves. Get it? Yeah. yeah. Thank you for the confirmation. Is <laughs> <laughs> that a question? Was that a question? <laughs> Is it? <laughs> that was, I was being. You know, Tony, Tony, I had to, you know, about uh, punctuation. When we worked on the bylaws and certain uh, legal things for the church, we had to be very careful where the punctuation went 
Because yeah. if you're not, then it changes the whole situation legally. Yeah. And that's what we run into a lot of times. Must have had a lawyer in the room, eh? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. And again, we've been going on two years now talking about questions Jesus asked. Yeah. Uh, 307 questions that we have recorded. That, therefore, I see is a great mode of teaching. Uh, instead of just directing, dictatic, comfort, you know, do this, 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 and this. One of my goals, I taught junior high and high school. And I loved, I, I wouldn't, I would always answer a question with a question. And usually it was, well, what do you think? What would you do? What, what, what's, what answer did you find? I would rather, as a teacher, get people to think than to just get knowledge. Why? Knowledge puffs up. Love edifies. And if I love you enough to get you to think, it's better than me to get you to do what I want. Uh, I like the uh, second part as well. I like to get people to do what I want them to do. So. <laughs> Number four. We may not like the answers to the questions. Very truly, I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned to joy. Uh, <clears throat> when we think about what Jesus said to the disciples, you're going to betray me, you're going to be sorrowful, uh, and to our knowledge, every disciple except John was martyred. Cut in two, crucified upside down, burned at the stake, beheaded, imprisoned. Uh, even John was on the Isle of Patmos uh, off of Turkey. Um, I think Maybe, and I'm, I'm going to be, man, I want to be careful here. The greatest, uh, I'll be 76 soon, and the last 50 years has been walking with Christ. So basically for 25 years, I had no life. thought I did, but I had no life. And even through tribulations and trials uh, he's there uh, I, I'll bet we could spend until next Sunday morning just us in this room sitting and talking about our individual trials and heartaches and pains and sorrows and disappointments and, uh, and I'm sure some of us far greater than others And he tells us, he says, but your sorrow will be turned to joy. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, um, my first introduction of him was several years ago. I forget the guy that wrote the book Bonhoeffer, but it's a tremendous book. Eric Metaxas. Eric Metaxas, yeah. Uh, I like that guy. Uh, but Bonhoeffer wrote a book himself called The Cost of Discipleship. Take up your cross and follow me. We, again, we may not like the answers to our prayers, but we hopefully can be like Job when he said, though he slay me, yet I will trust you. Uh, 
I don't know how many times in my prayers I've had a one word question to God. If not a thousand, none at all. Lord, why? Yeah. Why? Yeah. Uh, it's okay. That's an okay question. We may not like the answers, but we've got to trust Him. Because someday we'll know why. That's all. Uh, point number five. Life, more than often, comes by way of pain and suffering. A woman gives birth to a child. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you. Now is your time of grief. But I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. Now, I'll make a comment. This is me. Um, one of the most ridiculous things that I think I've seen nowadays is, is the pregnant man emoji. <laughs> I think that's just totally ridiculous. Anyway, um, so you might ask, well, what do I know about, it, about answering this question about a woman going through childbirth? But I, I will say this, I was there when both of my children were born, and I, and I, and I appreciate that. And, and, and just a little side note, um, my son and I have had some challenges in our lives. Um, you know, we, we, he's lived through a divorce, and, you know, we, we had some rocky times in our lives. But um, today... Trying not to get emotional here. Today we're going to celebrate his baptism upstairs. <laughs> so that's a, that's a pretty good time. Sweet. Um, so despite all those challenges in life, um, it's a day that I've really looked forward to for a long time. And, mm -hmm. and I think that um, you know the disciples here, they were going to go through a tough time. They were going to go through a period of separation from Christ. But boy, when he, when he came back, when he was resurrected... What a, what a tremendous joy that would have been to experience, uh, to see him. And I think it's, it's, it's similar to, you know, uh, ladies that have, have birthed children. I know that's a painful, rough time, but boy, how beautiful when they put that little baby in your arms and, and um, get to feel that joy. Um, a, a late Scottish preacher by the name of Alexander White observed that we all tend to hang heavy weights on the thinnest wires. He meant that we hang our happiness on fragile things that easily and quickly can be taken from us. Health, or our spouses, children, jobs, or possessions. These are good blessings, but they're inadequate for a foundation of lasting joy because they're all so uncertain and transitory. Anytime we go through a, a major loss, it's, it's painfully emotional, but we, we have to work through these losses because we're all gonna face them sometimes in our lives. And it's these times that the devil tries to attack our faith. He tries to destroy us. And, and, and there's been a lot of Christians that have been wiped out when they've faced some challenges in life. So Jesus is here telling these disciples and preparing them for what's about to happen so that when they did go through this time, all these persecutions, and they see their, their Savior being crucified, there would be hope ahead. Uh, two verses that kind of tie in with that is Romans 8, 18, which says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And also in Revelation 21, 4, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall be there be mourning, or crying, or pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. I, uh, I remember when my son was born, I was 19 years old, and Sherry, this tall, skinny, blonde girl, when she was having the labor pains, grabbed me and threw me across the room. <laughs> <laughs> and I asked the doctor, it must be pretty painful to have a baby. He said, well, it's kind of like this. Grab your bottom lip and pull it over the top of your head, and you'll get an understanding of what it's like to have a baby. Um, and 
had, as you were just sharing that, I'm so excited for your son, for you, and for the kingdom. Um, that boy's going to make a difference in the world. I believe that. Um, when we look at all, I just jotted this down as you were sharing. For what little we suffer in this life is nothing compared to the glory that will be revealed to us in Christ Jesus. <coughs> Grammatically, to my understanding, that doesn't just mean in the sweet by and by, but the rotten here and now. Um, so what little we suffer now, even in our suffering, is nothing compared to the glory that we can have in Christ Jesus while we're suffering. Let alone the promise of heaven. I, I don't remember the text, the location, but I remember the verse. If there is no resurrection, we are of all men most to be pitied. Uh -huh. Because we've suffered for naught. But there is a resurrection. Uh, eye is not seen, ear is not heard, it hasn't ever entered the heart of man. The things that God has prepared for those who love him. Um, yeah, we're, uh, what, what is it? Suffering, not that it's not suffering. I'll use the word suffering. Suffering may endure for a day, but joy comes in the morning. Weeping. Anybody remember the text more correctly? Weeping. Weeping may endure for the night. Say what? Weeping may endure. Weeping, yes. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Number six. Uh, we must first know what the day is. Originally I had when the day is. I changed it to what. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. When I changed when to what, had this thought in the day of the Lord. That phrase, the day of the Lord, is mentioned 94 times in the scriptures. Um, but concerning that day and that hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but my Father only. Uh, but he goes on in 1 Thessalonians, that was Matthew 5. First Thessalonians says, but you brothers and sisters are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. Um, in that day, here, it could be a couple days later, Resurrection Sunday, it could be when he appeared to him in the upper room. It could be the transfiguration. Being caught up into heaven. And this same Jesus who you see ascend will come in like manner. Is it that day or is it the day when he comes in like manner? Uh, I believe for us, obviously, it's his return. Uh, when he comes for the church, and when our bodies, those of us that are I was thinking this morning, I'm starting to know more dead people than I people. Dr. Buck Channing went home to be with the Lord yeah. Friday. Uh, dear, dear brother in Christ. Yeah. And uh, I envied him. And, uh, so that day, what is that day? It could be today. And it is today, if today is the day that the Lord has made Let's rejoice and be glad in it. Um, so that day can be a 
more than a couple of different days. It could be the day of awake today with your son. It's that day. <coughs> Following his day of the man's baptism. A huge, huge day. So, um, we had that happen to us 15 years ago. A man was in church and in our Sunday school class and died that afternoon. I wonder if anybody, I, I'll bet you from the last couple thousand years somebody's drowned in the baptism. <laughs> Oops. Comforting words. <laughs> Son, don't do it. <laughs> Put your floaties on first. Okay, okay. your turn. <laughs> oh. I'm going to give you the cliff notes here because we're, we're going to be, I'll miss the baptism if I don't finish this up soon. Wow. Um, Sorry. Yeah. Point number seven says, we know what it means to ask in the name of Jesus. Until now, you, you have not asked for anything in my name and you will receive and your joy will be complete. Just remember that we are ambassadors. It's by his authority that we pray. We, it's according to the will of God for the glory of God. And as Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, from John 14, 6. So think about that when we, when we ask. Make sure we're asking the King of the Universe and praying within His will. And basically, then, when we ask in the name of Jesus, it's not an abracadabra. It's by the authority of the living Son of God, I ask. Amen. Let's go to church. church.